it is my privilege to introduce uh, professor sushil mishra associate professor iit bombay he is an associate professor in the department of mechanical engineering iit bombay he holds his mtech from iit madras and phd from iit bombay his research interests are metal forming microstructure materials model fatigue and fracture residual stresses and thermomechanical treatment he has published more than 60 reputed articles in national and international journals he previously worked as senior manager at aditya birla science and technology company limited navi bomb now i would like to invite professor sushil mishra sir to hand over the session thank you sir for being here with us uh good afternoon everybody uh now i'll start my talk it is mostly one and half hour so uh, since there are so many participants we cannot take questions during uh, presentation however at the end we'll take all together so what i am going to talk is effect of microstructure on metal forming uh, i am faculty in mechanical engineering department in iit bombay Uh, I am working here for last uh, seven years. So what we'll do is in one and a half hours, what we we'll, we are going to do is first I'll give some introduction. Then why microstructure is important for any forming uh, uh, metal forming process, and then we'll just talk about the basic of metal forming. What you are already gone through. uh during this course however i will give some aspects of microstructure why it is important then fundamentals of microstructure then finally we will look at the effect of microstructure on micro uh, on forming and then uh, i'll take some few case studies uh, based on the effect of microstructure on forming so what is actually happens during any metal processing so there are two kinds of uh processes uh, uh we can see that one is called as a mechanical process like your extrusion rolling uh drawing pilgering straightening so many different mechanical process and then you have the thermal process where you do the change in the temperature like quenching cooling welding annealing and then phase transformation these two uh, production processes and then these two production process will control the materials microstructure like grain orientation texture recovery vitrification boundary precipitate and then combining all this microstructure will control the uh, property and you can see that this microstructure will also affect the production process so all the production parameters will uh, evolve or uh, controlled based on the what kind of microstructure development you are seeing during the processing so look at this uh, chart why microstructure because there is a processing the new microstructure and this processing the microstructure is all related with the property of the material and then uh, all this combining microstructure property and processing will effect the processing of the material and then all the center of this whole property microstructure processing and performance there is something called characterization you you must characterize your material beforehand going to any application characterization means you know the property of material what kind of property both mechanical property as well as the microstructural uh, Uh, details or microstructure features or microstructure property and then you correlate all those things not only how it will perform this microstructure whatever you are developing how it is developed during the process but we must also know that during the performance during the duty cycle how this microstructure will change and this change in microstructure will affect your performance so microstructure is not only up to the forming of the op, up to the fabrication of the parts or the manufacturing of the part it also play role during the service so you can see that first what you do 
you start any any process metallic process uh, so any processing determines the microstructure and microstructure controls mechanical pro material property and the property decides the performance so first you do the alloy design alloy design means you decide the what kind of alloy chemistry you want to choose and what temperature what the cooling rate all those parameter you do uh, design and this gives you the opportunity for new alloy development and then further you do the hot processing then you do cold processing after hot cold processing you do heat treatment then for the finishing process and then after finishing process you do the post processing and then finally it goes for the application so you can see that in each and every step like alloy design hot processing cold processing heat treatment then final product making as well as the post processing microstructure evolves during the process it changes from one phase to another phase it changes from grain grain structure it changes texture all this microstructure will change so first we'll see the glimpse of what are the different metal forming then we'll see what kind of different microstructure parameter and then how it affects the uh material property you can see that uh, this is the uh, landing gear uh, in um, aeroplane and you see how this landing gear is designed we go from the macro to micro to nano and then further you go to the atomistic level and see how the material property will behave at different condition so we our goal is so now there is no you can call it as a uh, you are you are do you are in domain of mechanical engineering or you are domain in metallurgy or in the chemical or uh, let's say a science like physics chemistry you, when you are developing a product you should know what kind of microstructure you should know what kind of chemistry you have you what kind of history it will go what kind of particular behavior all these interdisciplinary research we need to understand for developing one product when we are going for very high end product like uh, landing gear so look at the basics of uh, metal forming so what you do in metal forming uh, initially you so this is a just to uh, rewind our work uh, our uh, refreshing your knowledge what we are going to do is look at the basics of metal forming so what you do mostly there is a die there is a punch there is a blank holder then then blank with seat holder or you hold your material and then deform the material and the tool uh, usually called as a die apply the stress that exceed the yield strain to the metal and the metal takes a shape determine the geometry of the die so here what we are now, we are talking about the stresses that exceeds the uh, yield stresses so our whole domain is in the plastic region okay so there are different metal forming uh, process like bulk forming where you do the rolling process forging process extrusion process wire drawing and then you have the sheet metal forming here there you do bending operation deep or cup drying searing process and miscellaneous process all these different mechanical process undergoes different kind of state of stress okay this is the most important things in metal forming so when you are doing the mechanical characterization you mostly you do the unit cell tensile test or unit cell compressive test and try to assess the material behavior at that stress of state however simple unit cell tensile test will not be sufficient to understand the mechanical behavior or the microstructure evolution uh during the process so you whatever the microstructure you are seeing in uniaxial tension it will not be same in the biaxial tension or biaxial compression so you can see that there are different kind of state of stresses are acting like simple uniaxial tensile test biaxial uh tension then you did the triaxial tension then biaxial tension compression then you have uniaxial compression biaxial compression different kind of stress of stress you get and then see the example how this stress state are developed so a same product if uh, you are uh, 
pro producing through the rolling, you will get the by cell compression. When you are uh, developing through the forging, there is a tri cell compression. Then, if this you are bending at a by cell compression and by cell tension, so, so the kind of stress stress you are developing at particular part, like swaying, you are you are by cell compression for extrusion tri cell compression. And then wire drawing by cell compression. Each different kind of stress of stress will develop different kind of microstructure. So microstructure which you develop in the rolling will be entirely different than the forging, and then the bending, and then in the deep drawing, in the swaging, all these different uh, metal properties uh, will be directly correlated with the microstructure parameters what you are developing. So so what are the material property you need actually in metal forming? What is the desirable property? Let's say if you want to have a material uh, to deform. So we expect that low yield strength and high ductility. However, in the service, we need high yield strength. But for any desirable uh, product, if you are doing the metal forming, we expect it should be the low yield strength. Then these properties are affected by temperature. So ductility increases and yield strength decreases when the work temperature is raised. So what you do is mostly you prefer working at the high temperature. However, there are different uh, kind of uh, you know, losses you uh, incurred during the high temperature for uh, deformation. And then one more factor is strain rate. So usually in any metal for would like to have very high strain rate of deformation because your production rate uh, will increase but when we'll see that high strain rot rate will have different kinds of uh, metal behavior so when we deform a material some material shows the perfect plastic then some material will show elastic plastic some material will say elastic and the linear hardening and some will, will show the parabolic work hardening okay in all these all this material uh, is that gone more uh, okay all uh, just a second okay so uh, just a second pointer option paint okay Okay, so you can see that all this material property what you are seeing here is linear or elastic, elastic plastic or the linear hardening or parabolic hardening. It's all because of the, the kind of microstructure you have or kind of uh, deformation mechanism you are getting. And this deformation mechanism will dictate the property of material. So once you had started deforming, this is a, if it is a linear, uh, uh, plastic material, perfect plastic material. You reach parti particular stresses, and then you 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 flow that material in particular stress, and there is no hardening. However, if you see here linear hardening, you have to design your whole forming process. That stresses are flow stresses are increasing, flow stresses are increasing with increasing the deformation strain. Okay, so we have to account for all this stress and stress during deformation, not only the initial yield stress, but how the work hardening. So there are different work hardening law has been proposed, like Ludwig has proposed uh, uh, Holloman, Wall Sweep. Uh, and there are, there are several hardening laws are there in the literature. However, when you develop a different kinds of alloy, you design an alloy or different kinds of microstructure, there is a possibility that all this, all this, micro uh, hardening law will not be sufficient and this hardening law you are ma making based on the uniaxial deformation however it will not be it will not be applicable to bi-axial or plane strain or other complex strain uh, deformation so there is one thing is you are hardening how the hardening is happening and another is thing what temperature you are working so there are three famous uh, working zone we know one is a cold working warm working working and the hot working and you know that advantage of a uh, disadvantage of cold working and hot working for any material 
K and N, both K means strength and N is hardening or reduced at high temperature. So if you want to reduce the strength or you reduce the work hardening, you will have to work on the high temperature and then you get the additional ductility. And any deformation process can be accomplished by the lower forces and power at a temperature, high temperature. However, if this is the case, shall we go all the processing at high temperature? No, most of the processing uh, company or most of the processing we prefer at room temperature. So why cold, cold working? Cold working perform at room temperature or slightly above. Many cold forming process are important for mass production and there are minimum and no machining usually required. So these operations are near net shape or net shape process when you are working under room temperature or cold working. So what is the advantage? Better accuracy you will get. You will get the and closer tolerate, better surface finish. You get the strain hardened material. So what will happen that material is strain hardened. So what you will uh, get is the material strength is very high and hardness is high at the final product. The grain flow during deformation can cause desirable directional property in the product. So if you want to have some kind of directional property, you can produce. And then main thing is no heat is required. Okay, no heat for work required. So what happens that if there is low heat, low production cost and safety and so many things uh, uh, will be controlled. What is the disadvantage? Higher forces and power required is very high. Surface of starting work must be free of scale and dust. So we have to take extraordinary precaution for the uh, material to be deformed in room temperature. And ductility and strain will lim limit the amount of forming that can be done. In some case, metal must be annealed before further deformation. So you do multi-stage deformation. You deform at room temperature, then again detreat it, and then again deform. In other cases, metal supply is not ductile enough to cold work. So and then what you prefer is going to warm work, warm uh, working. And warm working is, it is close to a 0.3 TM, where TM is a melting point. And what happened here, the materials in the recovery region performed at temperature above room temperature, but below the recrystallization temperature. So we are not allowing uh, grain to recrystallize and dividing line between cold working and the warm working often explain them from melting point. Okay. What is advantage is lower force and power than the cold working. This is more integrate work geometry possible. Need for annealing may be reduced or eliminated. What is disadvantage is work must work piece must be heated. You know, any company if you say that you want to do the heating, they don't like it. Okay. Hot working the deformation at temperature above recrystallization temperature. So we are in practice, we are working in very close to 0.5 TM. TM is a melting point or above that temperature. And metal continues to soften as the temperature increases. And this is a about 0.5 TM. And what is the advantage is we get very uh, low stresses. So strengthening coefficient K is substantially less than the room temperature and the strain hardening exponent is zero theoretically. So what you see here, uh, sorry, what you see here, you can see that if you are doing the hot working, possibly you are in this range, okay? Hot work, uh, sorry, cold working, there is a hardening maybe linear hardening or the exponential hardening. However, the moment you go to the high temperature, you will get the this kind of behavior, okay? Which is a perfectly plastic, means there is a no, relatively no hardening during the deformation and you get the constant uh, flow stress during the deformation, okay? And then, then ductility, increased significantly. So work part shape can be significantly altered. Advantage of hot working is this work part shape can be significantly altered, lower forces power required. Metal that usually fracture in the cold working can be hot form. And the strange property of the products are generally isotropic because uh, what you do is as you see that in cold working when deformation there is a anisotropy because grain will deform in particular direction. However, here in the decay process, 
grain formations are mostly random okay no strengthening of the pot occurs from the work hardening advantage is in the case of pot to be subsequently prostrated by cold forming so mostly all the cold forming pot is 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 used uh, as a hard form hot form pot okay first you the hot forming then you take it for the so what you can do is I'll, I'll, up to the final finishing you can go in the hot forming and the final uh, stage you can do the cold forming what is the uh, disadvantage is lower dimension accuracy high total energy required here the deformation energy is low however due to the heat thermal energy is needed the total work is very high and energy to deform the material is very high and then one of the main problem you find in uh, hot working is the surface you find there is a oxidation and then you see the sort of tool like however these are the disadvantages so mostly we require to work at high temperature however we always like to work on cold forming so we have to look at that uh, uh, combination how you can uh, reduce the hot working and increase the cold working process one more factor which affect your uh, property is the strain and sensitivity and this strain and sensitivity is also because of the microstructure so metal what happens that theoretically a metal in hot working behaves like a perfect plastic and this this with no strain hardening okay so at when you are working at high temperature we expect that there is no strain hardening however what happened the metal should continue to flow at the slow flow stress once the stress is reached however an additional phenomena occur during deformation especially at ele elevated temperature the strain rate sensitivity what is strain rate sensitivity means how fast you are deforming your material if you are strain rate or your deformation rate is very high so what will happen your flow stress will increase so what you see that as the strain rate increases the resistance to deformation increases and this effect is known as uh, strain rate sensitivity suppose you are deforming at uh, uh, high temperature and when you are at low temperature uh, when you are doing the low strain rate then your curve will be like this however the moment you strain rate increase same material will behave okay uh, there is a work hardening and then as keep on you keep on increasing the strain rates and you will see the flow stresses are increasing so it is desirable that you need okay you desirable you need very fast process however as you are increasing the strain rate sensitivity because your forming process is very fast the flow stress will increase okay and then you can see the effect of temperature on flow stress you can see that the constant c indicates constant c here as the temperature is increasing as the temperature is increasing the flow stress is decreasing okay and then what you see is the the slope slope of each plot with increasing temperature you can see that at room temperature it is when you are deforming with strain rate this is your strain rate okay this is a strain rate strain rate is always denoted by e and then dot at the top the so strain rate as the strain rate is increasing at room temperature there is no effect of um, there is no effect of strain rate however as you are increasing the temperature as this is if you are t okay and this is your if is strain rate sensitivity if i plot m so this slope is called as a strain rate sensitivity so the m slope of each plot increases with increasing in temperature if i plot with t versus m you will find that as the temperature is increasing strain rate sensitivity is increasing so this is for you people homework i cannot go in detail why strain rate sensitivity is higher why strain rate sensitivity is higher when this temperature is increased why strain rate sensitivity is low at room temperature so you can go and search in uh, read in your textbook you'll find that answer so this this all the basics of bulk metal forming sheet metal forming is a part produced 
is phrase is called is a stamping okay so you do the stamping and then uh, you do produce uh, produce a part so low carbon is a low cost and good strength formability character so this is one example so sheet metal forming uh, involve different kinds of performance and room temperature most of the sheet metal forming you know 99% of the sheet metal forming process are done at room temperature and then these are the uh, sheet metal so you might have gone so many um, uh, so many uh, lectures before this that you develop a formal limit diagram and you find that this is uniaxial uniaxial tension this is a plane strain reason and this is your biaxial reason and you find that if you are changing the strain path from uniaxial to plane strain okay your deformation deformation strain or limit of strain is decreasing and then further you go to biaxial it will increase so as you are changing the strain path your deformation behavior of the material is changing and then then you can uh, define it isotropy and anisotropy so what happens that material is not isotropic when you are deforming in one direction it is uh, forming uh, differently and when we are forming in other direction the deformation uh, is low so that's what we uh, uh, develop a term like uh, r value this is called anisotropy anisotropy is anisotropy is with width strain divided by the thickness uh, strain so deep drawability is generally expressed by the limiting drawing ratio that is maximum uh, blank diameter divided by the punch diameter and there are two kinds of uh, uh, anisotropy one is called the planar anisotropy another is called normal anisotropy this is the normal anisotropy means this you might have got you calculate the r width strain by thickness strain at zero direction 45 if degree to the rolling direction and the 90 degree to the rolling direction and you calculate the r average however and then you get the uh, planar anisotropy means you can see in this curve why this cup is deformed in one direction more and then another direction less okay and then you uh, you see the wave kind of nature okay so far uh, ear for this is called the ear formation where that material is deforming at one in direction larger and then another direction which is a low deformation it is this is because of the microstructure the kind of texture is there okay so what you need to do is if you want to produce this part you have to cut from here and the whole this material is wasted and then you are not able to do the efficient or cost effective process this all this because you have the microstructure effect okay so now this is the basics of microstructure uh, basics of the forming what you see not we look at the fundamentals of microstructure so microstructure starts from if you look at the area of physics they talk about the electrons okay they, they are in mostly nanometer range okay and then you go in the atomistic region that is micrometer range okay nanometer to micro and then you go to the microstructure in microstructure you are in micrometer range and then there is a macro scale and in macro scale you study the complete deformation behavior okay so this is this is the area where we lie it is a material science where we we try to correlate from electronic configuration to the atomic arrangement and then the microstructure and then the macro scale so our dream is as a material science, scientist that we must integrate all these features okay and we start from the nanometer range and go up to the meter range so you know the structure of how the atomic arrangement is what is the crystallographic structure what is the microstructure and then you predict the white kind what kind of material property you will get okay so look at this microstructure i'm giving one example that is a, this is hcp microstructure and this is a titanium alloy it has a two phase alloy okay you look at the 
titanium this is type 64 titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium alloy you you have the hp microstructure has hexagonal post close packed microstructure it is called alpha phase and then there is a beta phase you can see that blue color that is your beta phase so look at this grains so this alpha the, the atoms are arranged like this okay and then it has this is a one grain this one has another grain and third one is another grain what is grain the arrangement of atoms in particular uh, orientation within the grain will be the same so if we see here what is grain boundary the orientation of this atomic arrangement has changed and here you will get the second phase like this is your beta phase which will have this is a bcc microstructure okay this is a hcp microstructure this is bcc microstructure uh, uh, sorry this is uh, hcp grain and this is a bcc bcc grain and then the combined one is called dual phase microstructure there are two phase when is alpha is there beta is there and this microstructure can exist in the labeler kind of equivalent microstructure or bimodal microstructure we'll look at in detail when we we'll do the case study so how to define a microstructure or texture so look at this your sample uh, this is your sample sample you always define by the uh, mostly we work on the extruded or rolled part uh, there we do the uh, rolling and extrusion so you define three axis this is your Uh, sample coordinate system. Sample coordinate system is your RD, rolling direction, transfer direction, and normal direction. And then you define your crystal. Crystal means your uh, unit cell. And then there is a crystallographic uh, direction. So this direction is your one zero zero. This direction would be zero one zero, and this direction would be Zero zero one, and this is your crystal direction. Okay, so so what you need to know the microstructure texture texture del changes due due to crystallization or solidification. When you are doing the crystallization or solidification, that time this kind of texture del. So this is EBSD map uh, where different color uh, denote different kinds of orientation. So during solidification or crystallization. Will form different kind of uh, deform, uh, deform uh, texture, texture or orientation of the grain. When you are doing the plastic deformation, uh, plastic deformation, plastic deformation happens through slip or twinning. We we'll look at that particular slide, and then this slip or twinning will also define the orientation of this grain. And then they say phase transformation. When there is a phase transformation, there is a change is the orientation of the grain and this uh, you form when there is a phase transformation there is always a orientation relationship between parent grain and the uh, transformed grain and you will get particular kind of uh, you can see in this microstructure you can see here the number uh, the grain numbers are given so this this grain 1 2 3 this is 1 this is 2 this is 3 And this each grain have different orientation. Okay. So how you do the uh, microstructure characterization? You need to do you there are there are different kinds of uh, techniques. One is the most common is axial diffraction method, ball texture method. Then you do the neutron diffraction. Neutron diffraction is very rare. You don't get access to that. SEM. Uh, along with the ebsd tem or orientation image microscopy you can tem also you can do orientation image microscopy then syn synchrotron x ray method uh, i think it is available only in uh, rr cad in the but uh, very uh, less accessibility to us and the ultrasound method however there are uh, very common method like you look at the uh, crystallinity using x ray diffraction and EBSD and uh, TEM, which is available in our lab. So look at multi-modal characterization. Okay, so now when you are doing the characterization, it is not limited that you do one characterization and say that this is the microstructure. 
look at this microstructure taken from the optical microscope and this is again t64 here you see the lamella here you can see that uh, this is a lamellar microstructure uh, white region is your alpha and black lines are uh, your beta however this is from optical this is uh, this looks like uh, uh, lamellar microstructure however to get more confirmation how these are stacked with each other you do that sem analysis sem microscope uh, and then you see there is a alpha and there is a beta however still you are not in that particular resolution then you go to the tem transmission microscopy here you can very well know you do take the diffraction pattern now you are 100% confirmed okay this region is your alpha region and this region these white lines are your beta region however when you do the uh, ebhd you will not able to resolve the beta phase because it is very finer phase okay so what you do then if it is very finer phase you go and do the transition kikuchi diffraction so this this is very relatively new characterization tool where the resolution of the uh, uh, ebhd scan increases so in transmission kikuchi diffraction what happens that you take the ebhd map in the transmission mode and then you here you can very clearly say red red is your alpha and blue is beta so you know that you have the alpha beta stacked in the microstructure so you need multiple characterization tool to understand the microstructure how you can see that this all this dislocation you can only see in the tem analysis you cannot see dislocations pile up at the uh, using ebsd or tkd or forget about sem and uh, optical so you need to go into the tem to see that how dislocations are developed and or interacting with the grain boundary or the phase boundary now there are we so as we said as we see we have seen that the uh, earring formation in the uh, cup it's all depend upon the what is the texture there are two kinds of texture you see here both the examples are available one is uh, uh, this is this is your morphological texture or this is a crystallographic texture what is my morphological texture morphological texture is how the grains are stacked okay this is this is the extruded material this is extruded magnesium alloy here you can see that this grains are elongated in particular direction okay so when how the orientation of the grain physical grain okay that is your morphological orientation so all the grains are oriented in the extrusion direction okay so what is the uh, crystallographic texture crystallographic texture means how the crystals are oriented okay so this is your you can see this is uh, a uh, grain which is morphologically oriented in this direction okay this is extruded direction okay this is this is your extrusion direction this one is your extrusion direction and if this grain is completely basal orientation and this this grain is pyramid orientation okay so how the crystallographic texture is uh, arranged and how the morphological texture is there both will dictate your uh, uh, material behavior during deformation as well as during the service so what happens that it is not necessary that your material is uh, uh, morphological texture and it will have the crystallographic texture it can have either way so it can have only morphological texture or only crystallographic texture so it, this crystallographic texture how it happens so there is something called deformation texture one one crystallographic texture you will get during the uh, processing like solidification another is called as a deformation texture so why does deformation texture result in texture development so what happens when you are deforming suppose you are doing the rolling or when you are doing the uh, forging this material will give crystallographic textured microstructure what happens that when you are deforming there is a plus plane strain deformation okay 
deformation then you get give then uh, sorry deformation there is a plastic strain you are developing a plastic deform strain and a plastic strain is accommodated accommodated by the dislocations motion and then grain will reorient so all the grain will reorientate re reorient to towards one orientation and then you will get the preferred orientation so why why only grain will orient in the one direction because at that particular direction deformation is easy there is a at that particular direction thus resolve shear stresses are low uh, resolve shear stresses are high and then what will happen the grain will try to rotate at particular uh, direction so grain reorientation depend upon the kind of what kind of strain you are develop, developing like compression and rolling what kind of slip you have for fcc it is 111110 for uh, uh, bcc it will be 110 plane at 111 direction and the stability of orientation okay if this orientation is uh stable or not so what are the factor affecting development of microstructure and texture is what is your deformation mode what is the composition of material that is your staking fault energy and impurity why can what kind of friction you are developing at what temperature you are deforming uh the extent of deformation uh second phase particle degree of intermediate deformation temperature and intermediate annealing so all this all these different uh behavior or different deformation parameter or material property will dictate the outcome or the texture of the material so how the plastic deformation happens we all know this because of the slip winning and the phase transformation uh and then when you are deforming there is a other deformation mechanism that is your creep mechanism like grain boundary sliding vacancy diffusion and dislocation climb so all these deformation different deformation mechanism will dictate the total metal forming behavior okay whether it is it is happening through slip or twinning or through phase transformation and creep mechanism and all these different uh mechanism will dictate the final microstructure of the material so as you know that when you do the plastic deformation this atoms move okay and this atoms move and the theoretical strength uh of the material is more than uh, 20 times than the uh, uh actual uh, stresses okay shear stresses why it is because they are dislocation when you have the dislocation what dislocation then what will happen the 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 stresses required to move this atom will be much much lesser than the theoretical strain so when you have the dislocation the deformation is very easy and then the dislocations are different kinds of dislocation so i'm not going in detail you must be having the basic knowledge of this dislocations and deformation i'm just trying to combine this uh, this uh, microstructure and the uh, uh, deformation so you have the edge dislocation and then you have screw dislocation but mostly what you'll find that uh, so what is edge dislocation when your berger vector uh, is the perpendicular to the loading direction then it is uh, it is your uh, 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 screw dislocation uh, sorry uh, this is your uh, Uh, edge dislocation and then when berger vector is in the in the slip direction then it is your screw dislocation so here this is, a, this is the direction of motion and this is the berger vector in this direction okay and then you have when there is a dislocation you have the in what is dislocation dislocation is means they there are some defects so when the what is defect here is you find the, here this one extra line or the arrangement of atom is there compared to the bottom half so what will happen here it will try to strain so you you will have the compressive stresses generation and then when you have the tension you have the uh, when you have the missing line you have the tensile uh, stresses develop so each dislocation will have their own energy and how the deformation happens because this it changes its sequence so like 
this will connect this will this will connect to this and further this decomposition will move and then you will get the uh, complete deformation process the dislocation can also attract and re repulse when they are, these are the negative sign this is positive edge dislocation this is negative edge dislocation they will attract each other and then dislocation density will decrease and then when there are same sign they will repel each other means you should if you want to deform any material you have to apply more and more stresses okay so how uh, dislocation move dislocation glide in the uh, in the slip plane and or dislocation will climb what is climb climb means this atom will jump to particular one more atom so what will happen this atom will jump up or down okay that is called a climb means what will happen it will change this atomic plane okay so so this is the way uh, screw dislocations move uh, this is your slip plane okay and then your screw dislocations are moving dislocation will move and then you will get the combined screw and edge dislocation so this is your pure edge here and this is pure uh, screw however you will find that you will get the both screw dislocation as well as uh, uh, um, edge dislocation and then this is a combined so when this dislocation will move then only your deformation will happen okay so dislocation line ends at the free surface of the crystal or internal surface of interface or closed loop it it uh, forms a closed loop okay here you can see that dislocation interaction in different crystallographic direction so as you know that all the deformation uh, uh, is happening because of the moment of dislocation and this you look at that particular orientation this is a 0 0 1 direction this is a 1 0 1 direction and this 1 1 direction you can see that dislocation movement is more or higher in the 1 1 direction compared to 1 0 1 and 0 0 1 direction so how this dislocation movement is 1 1 1 because in higher because this is a FCC material and the slip plane is one one triple one plane okay so you will get the higher dislocation activity at the one one plane okay and then uh, this dislocation can be annihilated or can be generated how you generate you deform the material so you can see that due to the accident of crystal growth during the formation in the melt and that mechanical deformation so due so you look at the any material whether it is a cast material or deformed material you will have the dislocation you cannot live without dislocation a material always have the defects that is your dislocation so uh, dislocation density you can see that annealed material you will get the uh, around 10 raised to power 8 to 10 raised to power 10 per meter square what the moment you deform the density of dislocation increases okay dislocation density will increase as the dislocation density decrease as we seen that this positive uh, dislocation repel with each other as the deform dislocation density will increase the deformation version will be difficult so because what happens that dislocation will uh, repel each other and they will not allow the movement uh, of the dislocation and you need to apply higher and higher stresses that's what you get the work hardening okay why we get the work hardening initially when you start here dislocation density is very less suppose this is annealed material and then you have then here is this dislocation density is around 10 to power 8 to 10 to power 8 as you start deforming what will happen dislocation density will increase and what will happen as the dislocation density is so suppose here initially there are few dislocations okay it is very easy to deform as you increase deform the dislocation density will increase so what will happen when the dislocation density is higher it is very difficult to move the dislocation when dislocation density uh, that uh, when the dislocation moment is difficult you need higher and higher higher and higher stresses to move the 
defocuser okay so that's what you are getting the work hardening so you can develop a defocation and you can annihilate the defocations we'll see that so this is a defocations uh, in the nickel alloy the defocation are loops are seen around the precipitate this is precipitate what is happening dislocation loops so what is happening these precipitates are not allowing dislocations to move it holds the dislocation okay so uh, i think i'll skip this slide this is more in detail uh, this uh, um, what dislocation does is it form a uh, deformation process it does slip fracture fatigue creep and diffusion okay so all these uh, dislocations will assist or will do this kind of process where a dislocation uh, uh, occur uh, slip occurs because of dislocation fractures occur because of accumulation of uh, dislocation fatigue phenomena will also happen because the dislocations will pile up and that make the uh, inside there is a uh, high slip band kind of stuff it, they will make which will initiate the crack it's a creep and then then uh, there is uh, a twinning a twinning mechanism uh, what we'll uh, see in further slide so this is the slip system you see in fcc what i was talking so this is your 111 plane this is your 111 plane and this is your 110 direction. What is slip plane? With the highest density of atoms. So if you look at this uh, plane, the, the density of atoms is very high at this plane. And if you, in, and this is in this direction, the density of atoms are very high. So at that very high density plane and direction, deformation will happen. So these are the few crystal system for FCC, uh, HCP and BCC. And HCP is very highly anisotropy because uh, the symmetry is very less. And then in BCC, they say no closed stack uh, slip plane. So there are multiple slip planes uh, system which activates mostly at high temperature. Okay. So there are different kinds of microstructure developed during deformation. You will get the cell blocks, Taylor relative cells, deformation band. Sear band, then uh, uh, then you can see that this is the sear band. When the sear band forms, it will can start the strain localization and crack or fracture can initiate through the sear bands. Okay, then uh, you'll have the different kinds of. So you can see this is the Taylor lattice. This kind of lattice when it forms is called Taylor lattice. Then you have the micro bands. Uh, then you have the cellular uh, blocks. You'll get the cellular blocks like that. Cell, cell formation is there. You'll get the cellular block. Okay. So different kinds of microstructure is developed. Like in low stacking fault energy, uh, the microstructure which develops uh, uh, are this. And for high stacking fault energy, you will develop different different kinds of microstructure. Okay. So the inherent material property stacking fault energy will also control the what kind of microstructure will develop uh, in turn this microstructure will also change the uh, deformation behavior why it happens look at the uh, uh, single crystal this is your slip plane so what have what will happen dislocations will move in the slip plane only when you deform dislocation will move in the slip plane so you can see that this is a grain this is one deformation this is a deformation axis and each grain one two then three okay four five each grain has different orientation so what will happen you can see that the how the slip band is formed it is in particular orientation okay here the slip band is this direction here is the slip band is this direction why because the slip plane direction is changing as the grain of orientation is changing and the on the surface uh, this is single crystal and then when you deform you will get this slip band okay so everyone knows this is uh, i'm going very fast in this because we have uh, very less time now we need to look at the case studies so what happens that 
critical resolve shear stress means when you are applying the load when you are applying the load at the slip how much load is transformed into the slip plane that will only dictate the whole deformation behavior so here you cos phi cos lambda is called schematic factor okay so you will get highest schematic factor at the 45 degree to the slip plane direction okay if this is a, in the perpendicular direction then they say no slip okay so you will get deformation will happen when the critical when the shear stress resolve shear stress will be higher than the critical resolve shear stresses okay and then you will get the deformation so you can look at this uh, uh, this is your grain boundary okay this is your grain boundary and dislocations are moving within the grain during the deformation so dislocations are moving and dislocations are moving so you can see that at the basal orientation uh, skewed factor is very high okay and the prismatic skewed factor is low 392 okay in pyramidal the skewed factor is very high very very high 631 so what will happen when skewed factor like uh, uh, critical result here is very high at 63 61 so what will get is the deformation will happen in this c plus a plane this is your c plus a plane and you can see that dislocation can move at c plus dislocations are moving uh, at c plus plane and then when the dis dislocation are not able to move it it goes to twinning so what happens is twinning is what happens these are the atomic arrangement earlier and then what happens dislocations are not able to move through glide or slip it will twin and it will form a mirror image so what is twinning twinning is a rearrangement of the atom okay so and then this rearrangement of atom is form the mirror image of the parent grain that's what it is called as a twin boundary and then similarly the way you have the slip plane you also have the different kinds of uh uh twin planes also okay so what happens that uh, this is the abc abc arrangement and then with deformation what will happen there is extra c is coming and the whole uh, arrangement stacking will change okay and then you will find different kinds of twin boundary uh, so you you will find the one side of twin central twin across the twin okay you get the different kinds of twin annealing twin twin comes during annealing and the deformation okay and how the uh, what are the uh, factor which affect the twinning is crystal structure stacking fault energy orientation strain rate grain size and working temperature all these parameter will decide the formation of twinning okay so when stacking fault energy is higher then perfect dislocation will form it will decrease partial dislocation further decrease twin will form and then a uh, very low stacking fault energy martin side will form so depend upon the stacking fault energy these different kinds of uh, dislocation or deformation uh, mechanism or dislocation or twin activity will initiate okay so you can see that how the when it slip happens what happens this atom will move okay at particular uh, uh, direction which is a slip direction and the movement of this uh, atomic is in multifold what happen is uh, twin this atoms position will change okay it is it just move very uh, move the partial atomic distance you can see this is your twinning plane this is the high uh, resolution tm this is your twinning plane and then you form the twin here and this is your matrix and you can this is a in situ tm uh, what we did here that with when you are deforming this twins are forming you can see the formation of the uh, twin with the deformation okay so similarly you will get the martin side formation martin side is very high uh, uh, hardness very very high hard face in steel and in titanium you also get the soft what is martin side formation is is a diffusion less deformation when there is a when when there is a uh, diff, diff, 
uh, when there is a diffusion less uh, transformation that is called martensite formation you will get uh, martensite uh, stress induced and strain induced you can get that uh, when you are deforming when you are deforming here and then you will get the strain induced nucleation of the martensite okay and when martensite forms it always has the orientation relationship between the martensite as well as uh, the uh, uh, your ferrite and that's what you get the preferred orientation okay and then what what effect the martensite formation is uh, chemical composition effect of temperature so when the temperature is high martensite formation will be less effect of austenite grain size effect of strain rate effect of strain path all these parameters so you can see that effect of strain path so how you are deforming your material if you are in suppose in uniaxial region okay you will form the less martensite so biaxial strain path so the much higher alpha uh, prime martensite than the uniaxial strain path okay when you are deforming at very high strain rate alpha martensite transformation is suppressed with increasing strain rate so you can see that your uh, whole processing parameter will depend will dictate the kind of microstructure you are forming at your material like uh, higher the grain size lower the martensite formation okay what martensite does that flow stress uh, uh, increases ductility decreases damping property decreases permeability it increases what happens it absorb the energy when martensite uh, forms and then delay the crack formation the increase in permeability is observed with strain induced martensite formation in fcc material however sometimes the permeability decrease in martensite formation because it, it initiate crack from there okay so that's all this microstructure will change your uh, uh microstructure features will change the deformation behavior then you have the strengthening mechanism like grain size reduction solute solution and strain hardening cold working i just go very fast like as you know that you by hall patch equation you decrease the grain size yield strength will increase then you can see that uh, as the grain size is uh, decreasing your yield strength is increasing okay similarly when you have the solute solution impurity uh, because of solute solution there is a strain involved in the mat uh, uh, the if matrix and because of this strain the strength of the material will increase and you will get the solute solution strengthening you can see that as the nickel content solute solution is uh, uh, percentage increasing its sensile and yield strength is uh, increasing so what kind of solute solution you have that will also dictate the uh material property as well as the strain hardening means already discussed then when you are doing the cold working or forging or drawing extrusion what will happen it will increase the dislocation density and the uh its material will get strain hardened and strength of material will keep on increasing you can see that um, uh after cold working you will get very high dislocation density and uh, you can see that This is a severely deformed nickel by the cold rolling. If when you are doing the cold rolling in the nickel, you will get nickel uh, material will get the very high density of the uh, dislocation. Okay, so when you do this is an example for uh, aluminium cold working. When you are deforming initially, there are very few dislocations. Okay, as you are keep on deforming, dislocation density is increased, and after fifty percent, you you will get the cell like. structure as we discuss different kind of uh, microstructure so when this dislocation density will increase uh, the strain hardening or work hardening will uh, keep on increasing and then you need to uh, uh, apply higher and higher stresses and then as you can see the dislocation density heavily deformed material uh dislocation density is, is around 10 to the power 10 and the carefully like any sample you will get the 10 to the power 3 so dislocation density will have very high propensity uh, when you are doing the cold working and you can see that the percentage of cold work as percentage of cold work is increasing your stress is also decreasing and 
your strain is decreasing so ductility decreases and uh, uh, strength increases okay this uh, like material processing when you are doing so you can see here the before ruling the grains are equiaxed okay they are uh, uh, they are equiaxed and then uh, after ruling what after ruling what you see that these grains are elong elongated in one direction so it has made morphological uh, uh, texture okay since ruling really affect the grain orientation and shape it will give you a morphological texture but still we don't know it is crystallography textured or not okay uh, similarly recovery what happens it reduces the defocation density so what happens that here there is a miss, uh, missing uh, uh, atoms what will happen atom will diffuse in the center and the dislocation will disappear when all this atom will infuse into the uh, stacking of uh, uh, when it will uh, infuse into the stacking of uh, atom so what is recovery recovery is process where you reduce the dislocation density okay and recrystallization means you completely form a new crystal that is a strain free crystal so what will happen you can see this 30 watt 33 cold work material there are a lot of uh, dislocations are there and with initially what will happen initial recrystallization will happen you can see very small grains are developing and then with further annealing what will happen you can see that new grains are coming and at the complete you will find the complete grains are fully recrystallized you will get the complete recrystallized microstructure which is strain free and also the grain size is also reduced because what happens that uh, uh, the nucleation of the recrystallized grain will happen at the uh, grain boundary or at the uh, dislocation accumulation okay so you, what you can see that uh, dislocation temperature uh, recrystallization temperature keep on decreasing as you increase the percentage cold work okay so what will happen if you are doing 10 percent deformation the recrystallization temperature is very high you keep on uh, increasing the cold work the recrystallization temperature will decrease so you need when you are forming your material you need to uh, know that at what temperature uh, you need to recrystallize this material based on the previous cold work so you can see that here uh, uh, with deformation uh, you will get the dynamic recrystallized grain what is dynamic recrystallization the recrystallization happens during the deformation when when you are deforming a uh, material and during deformation when the new grains will form that is called dynamic recrystallization so you can see that at the near the grain boundary you will see very fine grains which has which is dynamic recrystallized and in this material you will see that initially it is start from the grain boundary a few day dynamic recrystallization and then these grains are completely or fully recrystallized material so when you are doing the mostly dynamic recrystallization you will find at high temperature because you will get the energy for uh, nucleation and uh, growth and like you can see that deformation at high temperature when you are deforming what is happening is dislocations are developing the dislocations have developed and with further deformation dislocations are annihilated what happens process like climb or new grains will form dynamic recrystallized grain will form and which will be which will eat all the dislocations and it will give the strain free grain so once this is more, one more example if the uh, fatigue strain so when you do the fatigue loading also these dislocations will develop and then this higher amplitude dislocations will uh, rearrange with uh, with each other and then sometime you'll find uh, softening stress uh, flow softening because of the fatigue loading because what happens the dislocation will rearrange or uh, themselves and form forms the sub grain boundary okay and everyone knows what is grain growth is when the grain size keep on increasing then grain growth will happen and with temperature you keep on annual keep on annealing it and you will find that there are increase in the uh, grain size so mostly i have covered 
uh, what is the uh, microstructure, what is the forming, and what kind of strengthening or softening happens during the deformation uh, at room temperature, the high temperature, and what kind of microstructure. Though you, you need to go through the more study material. Uh, now what I'll do, I'll show you a few case study. So you can see uh, this is a Impuna 718 material. What we do, you can see that at, this is called cold working where the strength is very high. Here we are having very high uh, dislocation accumulation. Then this is a warm working, the strength has decreased. However, still you'll get the uh, um, uh, hardening. When you do the hot working, you'll get this complete, there is a no, uh, there is a no strain hardening and then you will get the dynamic recovery. Dynamic recovery means what is happened, dynamic recovery, these are, these are the dislocations are they are in, then they will, they will rearrange with themselves and then they form the uh, sub vein boundary and you will get the strain free or dislocation free uh, grains. Okay. However, what will happen is this is, uh, you deform then this is when there is a dynamic recovery, there is no hardening. However, when, as I say that when the strain free grain will form, the dynamic slice will happen, the flow stress will decrease. So forget about the hardening, we get the flow softening. So flow softening, what we see that strains are decreasing. You can see that at 10% here, there are no uh, dynamic slice grain. Okay. At 20%, you can see this grain boundary, you can see that some kind of wavy nature. And then, uh, then 30%, uh, you can see there is a small, the schematic small grains, which is formed during deformation. And then you see uh, grains are, there are small grains at the grain boundary, and then it keep on growing. And then you can see that this is a, DRV means dynamic recrystallized grain, and then this is a dynamic this is dynamic recovered grain, this is dynamic DRV, and this is DRS, the dynamic recrystallized grain. So when there's a dynamic recrystallization, you will get the flow softening. Okay, so what you do is there are different kinds of so you can see that same material type 64, which is used in the uh, uh, different parts of the engine or different part of the uh, um, any component and you have different kinds of microstructure. So you can see that the, this is a lamellar microstructure and then you can see this in the casing you will find that uh, uh, this microstructure used. In another part you see that people have used the equious microstructure because of the high ductility and better fatigue property. Here, they are, we are using lamellar microstructure because fatigue crack growth resistance is very high. And then you use the bimodal microstructure uh, that fatigue uh, uh, crack initiation and the FCR, FCGR resistance. So this is the process we have developed in the, our lab. So you can develop different kinds of microstructure via different routes. Suppose then what you do, you take to high temperature, and then you anneal it, then you deform it, uh, this temperature range, and then you further recrystallize it and you will develop complete bimodal microstructure. So what you can do is with deformation, different degree of deformation or different heat treatment, you will develop different kind of microstructure and these different kind of microstructure will be used in different kinds of parts. So you can see that this is what I was talking. We developed this microstructure in our lab. This is a lamellar microstructure. We deformed and we broken this uh, lamellar microstructure. So this lamellar microstructure, you can see this is all broken microstructure. And then you do the heat treatment and produce a bi um, uh, bimodal microstructure. So this is the way you can see uh, effect of uh, lamellar thickness. So this is a water current sample, this is air cool, this is furnace cool. Water current sample uh, will show us very fine lamellar, air cool, the coarse lamella, and furnace cool is very coarse, uh, very large. It's from TM you can see the alpha is very large here, here alpha length is decreases and then here we can see very alpha plate thickness is very small. So 
So based on your heat treatment, also different kind of microstructure will develop and it will, it will have different kinds of forming. So you can see that this is your, uh, uh, this is water quench, this is water quench sample, uh, this is uh, air pool sample, and this is your furnace pool sample. Okay, and all three will have different kinds of yield stress. So here, water quench sample will have very high yield stress. Uh, air pool will uh, have further lower and furnace pool will have further lower and their deformation behavior though it looks same okay though it looks same but because of different microstructure uh, because, because of the thickness of uh, lamellas are very different its deformation uh, behavior are quite different okay so we have seen that how it breaks how deformation happens this lamella will break initially okay this lamella will bend that is called kinking this is a kinking and this is alpha phase this is green is beta phase and then what will happen because of breakage you will find you can see that there are very small grains are forming very small grains are forming here and then further deformation this this whole uh, lamella will break and you will find very small grain and this is small grain further it will recrystallize and further deformation you will get the complete recrystallized grains okay so you can see that initially this lake breaks then it forms a globular microstructure in 80 percent this is a complete uh, dynamic recrystallized grain okay then you can see that uh, we have done we have uh, developed a whole processing map uh, like how you want to do how you deform the material and what temperature and what steel rate and what kind of microstructure you want to develop so you what you call it is a processing map you deform material at different temperature and different strain rate okay here strain rate from minus 3 to 1 and the temperature from 750 to 950 and you will find that what is the best preferred deformation zone okay so this is your efficiency and then if you see that in this zone you will get the highest efficiency of the deformation and then you develop microstructure processing map uh, you you have the different strain rate here here different temperature and then you can develop whole microstructure and impose it with the uh, deformation and map and you know that what kind of microstructure will develop uh what kind of microstructure will develop and so as we see that this was the reason where uh we saw that we, we are getting higher safety sensi and you'll get different uh, uh uh microstructure at different strain rate and uh, different temperature as well as this you do the multi-scale uh, characterization uh, this is the tkd with very high uh, 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 magnification then this is a tem you can see that uh, you do different scale of microstructure and different features here you can see this is your grain boundary this is all this this is a sub grain boundary what you see white, white line in the vsd map you can see that these are the dislocations which is uh, uh, sub grain boundary okay uh, so this is the effect of initial microstructure. If you have equivex microstructure, lamella microstructure, and furnace pool microstructure. The equivex microstructure, you can see that has shows lower elastic modulus and lamella shows very high um, uh, my, uh, yeah, uh, elastic modulus. Equivex shows proof stress is uh, lower compared to the lamella microstructure. Okay, and if you look at the ductility elongation, highest ductility you will get the lamella uh, sorry uh, in the equus microstructure okay so depend on the microstructure material property is uh, changing and uh, you can see that this this is again for in conal alloy we developed the uh, microstructure map and you can see the how the hardness profile is the same material we deformed under the different condition you can see the product what you are getting will have different kinds of hardness you can see that highest hardness you get at this region okay at this region you will get the highest hardness and then you choose accordingly and then if you are doing the annealing this is your deformation you will get very high hardness to do for the annealing your hardness will decrease 
so you can develop food microstructure microstructure deformation efficiency and then you can see the what is the property of material so you need to characterize material in each step and see that what kind of structure property relation we are getting uh, so we can uh, this is one of example in the magnesium if you do the tensile testing you will get different kinds of uh, deformation mechanism as a mostly dominated by the twin and then if you are doing the compression testing you are getting the at high temperature you are getting no twin okay so as we have seen that uh, stress of stress uh, changing from tensile to compression you will get different kinds of microstructure here you uh, you will have uh, texture this is completely texture material this is completely textured material magnesium it is a basal orientation at the center and as you annihilate this texture intensity will decrease and it will show the bimodal microstructure and uh, you can see that at higher annealing you will say do different kinds of initially there were no larger grain larger grain was not there and then as you further anneal you will see that large grains are developing and then you develop the bimodal microstructure okay and then based on that when you have the bimodal microstructure it it accommodates both it accommodates so in if you have the very small grains what will happen only shear band will form this shear band will form you can see this is a shear band formation if very large grains are there you will see the only twins are forming if you if you have a mixture of shear band and the twin boundary what you will say that you will get the highest ductility okay so what will happen here you are having two deformation mode one you are having the slip dominant and the twin dominant so at larger size grade you will getting the twin and a smaller grade you are getting the uh, slip okay uh, skip that skip that I'll, i'll show you one this example So this deformation is in austenitic stainless steel. See, this is undeformed sample will not have any martensite. Okay, this is two one zero. There is no martensite present in the uh, red. Red color is the martensite. When you deform in uniaxial, you see that in uni uniaxial deformation, uniaxial deformation. This is your uniaxial deformation. The red fraction is uh, increasing. At uniaxial, lot of martensite formation. you go to the plane strain uh, the martensite formation will decrease and if you go to the biaxial deformation uh, the martensite formation is further decreased so what you see that fraction of martensite will depend upon which stress state or strain path you are adopting so you can see here that at different strain path how the twin fraction of coming okay uh skip that this what so what you see here also is uh in uniaxial you will have different kinds of orientation shift orientation relationship than the plane strain and then the biaxial uh, biaxial strain path so how the strain uh, path or stress state is changing whole microstructural development is quite different okay uh so one more thing a sigma contained distribution towards the outer surface thick welded duplex steel you will find that the sigma phase distribution is very inhomogeneous at the surface at the top uh thickness uh, thickness 3.6 you will find very less uh, 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 uh sigma phase as you are changing the position sigma phase uh, uh fraction is changing so what you learn from here is sigma phase so distribution profile with a peak at around 20 mm away from the fusion line so when you do when you are doing the welding you will see that sigma phase distributions are different and this sigma phase is very hard phase which can dictate uh, the material property or the fracture behavior very heavily so we we should be aware that how this uh, second phase particles are uh, distributed in the material and uh, uh, so these are the so i took i think i ate some of the time from the question hours i'm sorry for that these are the few uh, references which i i took it from uh, 
these papers or books, whatever I have presented, and case studies are mostly our work from the, our lab. Uh, I would like to thank you for the uh, your attention and uh, with this tough time you have come for the talk and doing uh, this uh, at the afternoon. I would like to thank you again. Thank you.